Win or lose, what fight would I like to do over and why? Okay, that was a question I could have answered with the snap of my fingers when I was competing. When I stopped competing, I became a lot nicer guy. I used to walk around with a chip on my shoulder. I had edge. Maybe you saw that in interviews or maybe I was pretending to be polite, but inside I had an anger. I knew I was the best. I went, I was, the world was working against me, not even giving me my opportunity. Nobody could beat me in a fight. Nobody could beat me in a round of a fight. I am the guy and I'm getting told no. I've been getting told no in this sport from Jump Street to the point that my mother put a plan together to bribe Joe Silva just to give me a contract in the UFC. That plan did not work. But I'm speaking to the level of desperate. I couldn't get in. I'm training with world champions every day. I know right where I stand. There's 5 million men on earth, and there ain't five of them that could beat me. And I couldn't even get in the organization. So I had that legitimate anger. And you'll see a lot of guys that do. A lot of guys will be able to relate and feel the way I felt. Now, fortunately for me, when my story was told, I did get those opportunities. Life would have been a lot harder if not given the opportunity. So I could have answered that question very quickly, but now I don't. And I don't want to call one of those guys out because I don't want to go back to that. I like being dad. I like being wrestling coach. I like talking to you two people. I like that. And I really don't want to revisit some of the, those constant emotions. They stopped me from going to sleep at night. They forced me out of the bed in the morning. I had to get in the gym. Last thing I want to do in the morning is get in the gym. It was just one of these things where it was a very helpful, but it was also for a different life that I don't want to live anymore. If you want to know the one match, that if I could go back, if I could be in that moment, if I could have two minutes of my life back, it was a college wrestling match. It was the blood round of the NCAA's 197 pounds versus Zach Thompson of Iowa State. Chael, what is your favorite weight division to watch? All right. The best fighters are the smaller guys, without question. You're going to have a very hard time telling me everybody, anybody that's ever done this sport is better than Dominic Cruz. You're going to have a hard time convincing me that when Conor McGregor was the champ and the champ here of the two toughest weight, toughest weight classes, that that was not glaringly obvious that he should be ranked number one pound for pound. But I do understand that this sport is driven by the big guys. and was the exception, Conor McGregor, the exception, Floyd Mayweather, the exception, Oscar De La Hoya. It does favor the bigger guys, for sure. The George Foremans and the Mike Tysons, I mean, they're going to be the ones that get the credit. The Muhammad Ali's and the Jack Johnson's, it just goes to the bigger guys. There's something special about when Brock walks into the room. There's something special about Engano's presence. So I think the fights that I most look forward to over the history of my life have been predominantly at 205 pounds. While the bigger guys have always been featured, the biggest weight that largely is featured, I bet you I'm right. If you were to go back and look at every pay-per-view in history and look at the numbers, I'll bet you I'm right that more sold out at 205, more had an interest at 205, more live gates were driven at 205. That's the Tito Ortiz. That's the Chuck Liddell. The guy that never gets talked about, was one of the greats ever, was Frank Shamrock. It's where Boss Rutten would have been if that weight class had existed. It's where Kevin Randleman would have been had that weight, where Randy Couture was, where Daniel Cormier was. I mean, 205 pounds is probably the most special weight class for me over history in a, in a long stroke. Right now, I'm very interested in the entertainment matches. I'm very interested in Colby versus Masvidal. No belt up for grab. Pure grudge. I'm very interested in whatever Nate and Nick are going to do next. I'm very interested where Poirier is going to decide to compete next. Overall, light heavyweight. Heavyweight should have two minutes between rounds. It would improve every heavyweight fight. Discuss. Well, you're not wrong. Of course you're not wrong. You could give every fight two minutes between rounds. Yes, you give a guy more energy, he's going to go out there and do well. Everything's got to be treated the same. We can't treat anybody different. Imagine we did that to the women. We're going to let women within the sport, but they're only going to go three-minute rounds. I mean, right? You see the problem? You see the message? You see the fire that you're playing with there? And now you're doing the same thing with the big guys. I mean, people are going to accuse you of fat shaming the second you, that leaves your mouth. But I get your point. You're talking about bigger guys obviously doing the same thing as littler guys can't do it as long. You're right. You make a perfectly fair point. 
I would not be upset if everybody got two minutes. I wouldn't be upset if we did away with rounds completely and put you out there for 12 minutes, one straight, we'll judge the whole thing. I, like None of that would bother me. It was very arbitrary why we picked rounds, why we picked three minute or three five minute rounds, why we picked five five minute rounds for main events and or times. It was extremely arbitrary. It was just some guy in a room, and I'll, I'll tell you right now, who had never done it. I don't know who was in the room the day that, that came out, and I guarantee you I'm right. Whoever sat in that room, not one of them that wrote that number down had ever done the sport. That's a true statement. Somebody was there the day that happened. If that somebody hears this, that well, Chael's got us on that one. But here we are. Wanting to be like other sports, but throwing something in that no other sport would do. The Super Bowl does not just become five quarters because it's the Super Bowl. The 100-meter dash doesn't go 105 meters because it's for the gold medal. They're the same. Everybody does the same, except our sport, but nobody's pushed back. Nobody's complained. Nobody thinks that's weird. I'm all alone. That's not the hill I'm going to die on. I'm not going to die on any hill that goes against the leadership of our sport because we're very lucky to have the leadership in our sport that we do have. That one's a surprise. If I was a commissioner, whether I got it adopted or not, I would submit that within my jurisdiction, I'm going to shorten the time limit. I would be looked at extremely fondly. By the community, I don't even have to get it done. I just have to be the one person to submit that doing this less time is obviously better. If I would sit down with three people in the same room, who would they be? All right, I'm not going to answer that literal because I've, of course I'd have to bring my father who passed away. I'd have to bring back my grandma. I, th I don't think that's what you mean. Like, who would be really interesting to sit down, have lunch with, and just just visit? I got to talk, I got very close to this one time. One of my idols, Les Gutches, baddest man I've ever, baddest man I've ever put my hands on. And I always wanted to meet John Smith. The John Smith, head coach of Oklahoma State, possibly the toughest son of a bitch to ever be born. And you're still giving me room for a third one, but I got that night one night. I get sat down at a table I'm straight across from Les and John Smith. And the way my wife tells the story is that I sat there like this the whole night. But I asked John, three and a half hours, I asked John Smith every question I ever wanted to ask John Smith. I bad, he probably did not have a very good time that night. He probably did not thoroughly enjoy that, but he answered every one of those questions. And I mean, it was amazing. I'm a huge wrestling fan. He's the greatest wrestler ever. Six in a row, all golds, two of those being the Olympics. Head coach, Oklahoma State, went on won a bunch of national championships for them. Still red hot and doing well. I got to ask him every question about everything. And don't forget, when you're talking to, to John Smith, you're talking about one of the first families of wrestling. Now I get to ask questions about Leroy. I got to check in on Mark. I got to hear what's up with Pat. So if I, if I could go back to a conversation, I'd go back to that night. I'd have my idol, Les Gutch, just sitting here. I'd have John Smith sitting across me, and you're telling me I get to add one more to the mix? I already had my hot-ass wife. I mean, I'd say I had that moment. Should the UFC create the ability for fighters to fight both in boxing and MMA? I'm against it. I'm against it. I think that those sports are very serious business. If you want to go out and grapple, grappling could be put in the category of fun. Now, not everybody would call grappling fun, but you could put it in that category. You're going to get some attention. You're going to get some hard work. You're going to have a goal. You're going to have something to work forward to. Then you're going to have a finish line, and you're going to have resolution. You're going to get your hand raised, or you're not, and you're very likely to walk out of there in one piece. When you add strikes, this is not a game, and this is not to be played with, and that does not go in the bucket of fun. In our field, it's necessary, but we have some tremendous leadership. The president of the Associated Boxing Commission, Mr. Mike Mazzulli, wants fighters to fight three times a year. He could live with them fighting twice. He wants no more than three. He has not made that a hard and fast rule. You will have the exceptions. Chemaya was on that run. Of course, you're going to be telling me about Cowboy Cerrone. That's the number that he likes, because he likes those breaks. He understands that this is combat, and that recovery has to be forced upon the athletes. And when you start talking about letting a guy do, do both, you're talking about two very dangerous sports. In all fairness, this is a contact sport. People wanted to shut down at one point. 
thinking it was so dangerous. And Dana was always very honest on this. And Dana said, look, nobody's saying this is good for you. And as soon as Dana said that, the wave started to turn. That was just the honesty. That was just the honesty that a leader needed to say at that time. And it was true. And I'll say it too. Nobody's telling you this is good for you. I want you to be prepared. I want you to work hard. I want you to have sparred. I, want, I don't want mismatches. I want you in there with a good, solid competition where you know the rules that, that include somebody throwing in a towel and getting you the hell out of there. Somebody who you trust more than anybody in this world is right behind you, ready to get you out of there. But as soon as you start dipping your foot in both waters, you're now not going to show up once unprepared. You're going to show up for two events unprepared. I don't like that idea. Is a hot dog a meal or a snack? Yeah, a hot dog can be a meal. You got to understand the hot dog, it can be a meal. I would need two. And it would also matter what you put on it. But I had this conversation last time about is a hot dog uh, a sandwich or not? I disagree. I think that comes down to condiments. I'll make it a sandwich, but I'm going to put cheese on mine. I'm going to put relish on mine. I'll put lettuce on mine if I can find it. I'll settle for some sauerkraut. I'll put a squirt of chili. If, I, if I'm in 7-Eleven, I'm going to put cheese on one side and chili on the other. But I'm going to sprinkle with onion. I mean, it's going, to be, it's going to be heavy. You're going to be full. That's, what, that's the difference between a meal and a snack. I don't care about a guy that, that wants to go have a bowl of cereal as his dinner. I don't have a problem with that. Did he have enough cereal to get full? Did he put it in a pot like the way I like to do? Dump the whole box in there like I like to do. If you leave full, then it, it was a meal. If it's just supposed to tide you over in between, it would be a snack. But I, I've never really heard of somebody doing that. My kids like hot dogs. But if it was after practice or it was after school, we got to get home. Mama's going to have dinner on the table at 530, which she happens to do every single night. We sit down, pray, and eat together. I can't get them a, a hot dog. That would fill them up. I got I to gotta get them something else. Goldfish is a big one in my house. Bag of cereal and all failures that just dip their hands in there. I think a hot dog would fill you up. I think that it's too filling. The way I would make a hot dog, I'd probably get two of them. I generally do go into 7-Eleven. I'll put kraut on one, but I'll put, I'll put ketchup and I'll put mustard on there. And the other one would just be chili and cheese. I'll leave full. For me, it's a meal. What city have I enjoyed visiting most for an MMA event? I will tell you, I had a life-changing experience in Israel. I felt something. Now, I went to Jerusalem. I went to the room that Jesus died in. I touched a board that contained Jesus's blood. So that's going to change anybody. That will change the worst, but you're going to feel something. And that would have been most interesting for me, not to mention, you got this conflict in the Middle East. And this isn't a situation where you pick sides. And I don't talk politics to you guys, but this is not a situation where you pick sides. It's real simple, okay? And when I was there, a rocket got launched in and the Iron Dome shot it down and we all get taken to this underground bunker. I'm literally in an underground bunker with my wife and Hoist Gracie and 200 other innocent people that don't know what's going on, right? We don't know what's going on. The math on this is real simple though, guys. If somebody waved a magic wand and could take every weapon away from Israel. The Israelis will not exist 24 hours later. If Israel had the ability to take everybody else's weapons away and Israel had them all, nothing in the world changes. And if you think that that's not going to be a powerful experience, let me tell you, it, not to mention it's beautiful. Most beautiful beaches I've ever seen. I was stepping on the sand. The sand was different. I thought all sand was the same. The grains of sand were different. You talk about crystal clear water. I've never even seen a postcard. Not even seen a, like the beach that was right outside where we stayed in Israel. Boom. There's my, if I could go back, go in there, I'm getting some shawarma. If there was one thing I could go back in time and change about my UFC career, what would it be? Okay, the only reason that question is hard is because you said I only get to pick one thing. My life has been an assortment of regrets. I'm one of those armchair quarterbacks. Everything is so clear and obvious as soon as it's done. And if I could go back, I would have practiced jujitsu. When I found out the power in being able to pass and pin people down as a way of maintaining that position, life became a lot easier. But I came from a time where don't pass, stay in the guard and pound. 
If you're pounding, they're not going to look for a submission. They're too busy defending. I came from that school of thought. We were the masters of ground and pound. And I also got into MMA by walking into wrestling practice one day. It was just Dan Henderson, Randy Couture, and I. Every day at three o'clock, I walk in one day. They're not wearing wrestling shoes, and they throw me a pair of gloves. They say, we're doing this now. So when I started in MMA, I mean, I not only got the world champion and the pride chip, we just start fighting. That's it. We fought until we were exhausted and we went home and came back the next day. We did that for years and we won championships doing that. But then we realized, hey, we need to do this just like we did wrestling practice. We need to have a structured room. We need to come in 15, 20 minutes, warm up and stretch out. We need to spend another 30 minutes on skill building, drilling, new techniques. Then we'll get into our live rounds. Then we'll finish up with conditioning. That's the way we do our wrestling practice. Let's put that same respect into this career. And as soon as we did, things got a lot better. When my career ended is when I got real heavy into jujitsu and went on to get my black belt, which I'm extremely proud of under Fabiano Scherner. But one thing about that, once I started learning jujitsu, once I started learning what you can do in these positions, that was more than just pound. I just only had fantasies of if I could go back. And guys that come up through the same gym now as I did then have to do that. You cannot show up and start sparring with the pros on day one. You will come through an amateur program. You will be in the jiu-jitsu rooms with the white belts. You will be getting boxing and kickboxing training in more of an aerobic format where you're working on your techniques, you're working on your positions, not just going full speed with something that you think is going to work. And if I would have had those opportunities, if I could have humbled myself a little bit more, I think I could have extended my career and definitely had a couple of more wins. Which fight did I know I was big trouble within the first minute? There's only been one. I have never fought or wrestled anybody that beat me that I did not want another chance. And I got a lot of... I fought Trevor Prangley three times. I fought Jeremy, Jeremy Horn three times. I fought Anderson Silva at least two times. I fought Babalu at least two times. Then we went out and grappled in a third time. It was just one of these things where I was pretty good at getting those rematches and I really wanted them. The only guy I ever fought, I never talked about it again. I never pursued finding him again was John Jones. That was just a different deal. I remember coming right across the ring and coming right after this guy. And don't forget, I had a very unique situation with John, which is I trained with him. And I don't mean that I ever touched him. We were on the set of The Ultimate Fighter. The Ultimate Fighter, which gets presented to the world, is a reality show. The reality is it's a show. There's no, nothing else about it. But it's the ultimate training camp. The most beautiful facility, any coaches that you want, and a whole crop of teammates with like-minded goals and dreams twice a day. It's the ultimate training camp. So when I did this, I did the same thing that each one of those athletes did. I never missed a practice. Every punch they threw, I threw. John never broke a sweat. So I, I feel as though, like, I, my confidence is going, okay, he can't be in the shape that I'm in. It's just not possible. And that's before I've got my, my goodie bags of secrets, right? I'm going to train hard. I've outworked this guy. I know that for sure. He's going the other way with his body. He's staying up late. He's eating wrong. He's having a good, I'm gaining confidence. And this is before I know I'm going to treat my ass like a pincushion. Did all of those things. Showed up with a higher juice concentrate than Tropicana. He still pushed me across the ring. Hit a spinning elbow. I mean, that elbow missed. That same elbow. He, he, that elbow missed. And I, uh-oh, this is a different deal.